I like to say I don't time markets, but my money does, right? Because what that means is that generally, if it meets our criteria, we're buying more. And if it doesn't, we just happen to be buying less. If I was to recap 2023 in, in simple terms, it's been that bid ask spread that we hear about in the market. And that comes from seller's expectations being set at a really high level over the past few years. And they're looking at their asset and saying, I haven't done anything different. Nothing's changed in my day to day. I still want that same price that I was getting offered a few years ago. How come you can't give me that? And then we're on the buy side saying, well, everything's changed. Like as the market shift, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of uncertainty. Earlier this year, you'd hear the term, we're pencils down. We're, we're laying off the acquisitions team. That's one take on it and that's really fear driven. But for me, when I look at navigating a downturn like this, now's the time to double down. And like you said, we buy in all, all market cycles and, and good investors have to figure that out. Welcome everybody to Self Storage Income. And today we have one, it's it's actually kind of funny because today guys, we're, we're talking about acquisitions and it's interesting because we get to see the back end data. So we get to actually see what everybody likes or listens to on the podcast. And uh, we find in general, the ones that do very well are, uh, we have like our intro ones, meaning the beginner podcast, right? Which that makes sense, right? Because that's a huge amount of our listeners. All you guys are trying to get into self-storage. You want to start investing. You want to get that self-storage income. And uh, so that makes a lot of sense. But the one of the highest consistently always is acquisitions. It's getting the deals. It's figuring out what's going on in the market because the number one question is, is it a good deal? Is it not? Or should I be buying now? So we are doing today, we are doing an end of the year 2023 acquisition um, recap, and then an outlook on 2024. And for this, we brought our very own head of acquisitions, Brian here, you've been on the podcast a number of times before. Thanks for coming on again, man. Yeah, long walk for you to get here. You made the big trip. <laughs> One office over. Yep, one so office nice over. So <laughs> yeah, good to be back. It's been a minute. So. <laughs> How you doing, man? Yeah, doing good. Doing good. Good. Twenty twenty three has been a uh, uh, quite a year. It certainly has. It's been a lot different than the last few. Yeah. Um, so it's it's brought its own challenges. So been trying to navigate that. Been able to close a few deals this year, and and hopefully looking ahead to twenty four, we can uh, figure out how to navigate that market and and keep moving forward because that's really what it's all about. So. So why don't to start this whole thing off? Why don't we do that just to you know, like talk about the last three four years here and twenty three in comparison to the others to kind of set a framework so people that are either just getting into it now or have kind of been looking to know what is different, how different is it than it's been over the last you know five years? Yeah, I mean, I, I would start off probably by just talking a little bit about us as a company and like what our buying criteria is, because that really hasn't changed much. Like at our core, we're value add storage investors. Yep. We go out and buy non-institutional deals, and then we, in a sense, institutionalize them, run them very well, um, go out, raise capital. Um, and that's been our strategy for a long, long time, since before I was here, since you and your dad were starting the company. So that's always been at the core of what we're looking at uh, when it comes to acquisitions. Now, what what's changed a ton has been the outside forces, and those are all the things that we can't control. So um, that the market shifting, starting with interest rates going up, completely changes how we have to underwrite these deals and project future income on these deals, and in a sense, what we can reasonably pay for these deals in order to make a return. Um, so as interest rates went up this past year, that's really shifted the way we go about finding, making offers on deals, underwriting deals, and what we can actually buy. Um, and so I think kind of the big, if I was to recap 2023 in, in simple terms, it's been that bid ask spread that we hear about in the market. And that comes from sellers' expectations being set at a really high level over the past few years. And they're looking at their asset and saying, I haven't done anything different. I still run it the same way. It's still there. Nothing's changed in my day to day. I still want that same price that I was getting offered a few years ago. How come you can't give me that? And then we're on the buy side saying, well, everything's changed. 
our cost of capitals changed, what we can achieve as far as rent increases go and how occupancies are in the market. Everything's changed on our end. So we can't give you that price that you were at a couple years ago. And so that's really what's caused this kind of freeze in 2023, why we've seen transaction volumes so low um, for both on market and off market deals. And so us as that same steady value add investor philosophy, um, we're still navigating those waters. We just gotta shift as the market conditions change and then be, be aware of where we're at in the market and then know when we can make a good deal and make a, make a deal happen. So it's been a lot, of, a lot of the same for us internally, trying to navigate the external changes that we've been up against. I, this is, um, honestly, this is probably the most important point that we could even get at and express. And you guys probably have heard, and I, I say this, we buy in up markets, down markets, sideways markets, right? Because what Brian just said is true. We are navigating external things that we don't have control over, but our internal things don't change. So if a deal meets our internal stuff, even if external stuff are haywire, we still move. The external stuff just changes lots of times how many deals meet our internal uh, uh, qualifications or criteria. But whether it was, and you know, really we are looking at a perfect example of this is the last three years. There has been no bigger swing in self-storage history of external factors than the last three years by a margin that is like wild when you can look at self-storage in the external factors, right? But during that time, we're still buying, we're still moving forward, we're still doing these things because our internal factors haven't changed. Now, that may make your job a lot harder because now instead of, you know, oh, one of 20 deals that are coming to the market, you know, that one may look really good and we may have an interest in. Now it may be one of a hundred or more and two, the volume of deals. So it, like the external things change how we have to do things, right? But what we internally are looking for and doing that hasn't changed. So I completely agree. That is the perfect spot to start. Um, we do not time markets, meaning we are not buying because, oh, the market's down or the market's top. I like to say I don't time markets, but my money does, right? Because what that means is that generally, if it meets our criteria, we're buying more. And if it doesn't, we just happen to be buying less. But it's not that we are trying to pick it. And uh, that's a really important thing to set the stage. Yeah. And I, and I think, too, like as the market shift, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of uncertainty. So people react to that. Um, and I think for, for us here, kind of our core philosophy and how we're looking ahead is like, we have to be doing the same activities day in, day out. Like now's the time to double down and keep doing those things. Earlier this year, you'd hear the term, we're pencils down. Um, I mean, you'd hear, not necessarily in self-storage I was hearing, but in other asset classes, like we're, we're laying off the acquisitions team. We're, we're not buying anything for the next at least 12, maybe 24 months, like that we're just on the sidelines. And that's, that's one take on it and that's really fear-driven. But for me, when I look at navigating a downturn like this, and, and I'm not as experienced as a lot of others, but like this is the time where you have to have more of a, you have to be doing, working three times as hard to have a better pulse on the, the market, to know spot opportunities when they come up and to be able to buy them. And like you said, we buy in all, all market cycles and, and good investors have to figure that out. So um, I think this year has been a lot of grinding, a lot of, uh, like I said, we have to work three times as hard to try and find one solid deal that we feel confident in and to put under contract and, and, and bring to our investors. So um, I think that's been cool. Key for us, uh, when I look back this year at some of the deals that we have bought too, um, some re reoccurring themes for us are like reputation, relationships, um, being active in the market. Like those are what's won us a couple of these deals this yes. year. 30% um, of the deals we bought this year came on market. 70% came off market through relationships that we have been nurturing for a long time. So deals still transact. It's not all doom and gloom, but just be knowing that in this season of the market cycle, you just got to work, put your head down, keep doing the things that 
brought results for you in the past few years and then mm-hmm. and then have the knowledge and and be underwriting enough deals and making enough offers and negotiating with sellers and brokers to know hey we actually got something here we can confidently do this because if you're not if you're on the sidelines if you're letting that fear uh hold you back then even if a, a great deal hit you in the face you wouldn't feel confident to to, to move forward well, on it. and you and you can't even un, like you can't even see it so it's it's interesting because the these things that you're talking about here, guys. The, everybody listening to it, this is this is the this is it. This is the premise of everything. Because when you hear pencils down, that's exactly why deals get better, right? So let's take it to the very basis. If we say what is a good deal versus a bad deal, if we're going to say that what is a good deal versus a bad deal, the only thing that I believe you can compare it to is you have two sides. That would just be. I'm buying it for what and what am I making it for? And what is the opportunity with it? Those are the two things, right? That's a comparable thing that you can look at it and say, all right, because everybody else may have different criteria on what a good deal is versus a bad deal. In the most basic sense though, those are the two things. I bought it for a million, it makes half a million dollars in cash flow after everything, net cash flow. Or I bought it for a million and it makes $5,000 in net cash flow. One of those is a good deal or a better deal than another in the most basic senses, right? And then also then, or is I bought it for a million, it makes 5,000, but I can make it make 5 million in cash flow, right? Using exaggerated things to just talk about the point. Those are the underlying two things. Well, when you hear things like pencils down, what that does is you take out the most basic principles of price in a market, supply and demand, meaning that demand from buyers is going away. Pencils down, buyers aren't buying. That means then sellers will eventually have to start doing things that they never had to do prior. Like uh, the off-market deals that Brian got this year. We have you know seller finance deals where in a good market, they wouldn't have agree- agreed to that. You know, we have one deal where they came out at whatever it was, like eight plus million, and you got that thing under contract however many months later for, what was it, in Oklahoma City, uh, six, six, five is what we ended up with. Yep. Um, that wouldn't have happened two years ago, right? So the pencils down, right, has that effect. But when we're looking at our deals, those deals that you're buying and underwriting, you're making these things work, Um, you're winning and we're getting deals in the marketplace because you're not pencils down and you're not being driven by fear because if you're being driven by fear, when you look at a deal, the emotion side automatically gets rid of the opportunity. Whether it's really there or not, you can't even see it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's being driven by things that too probably have nothing to do with that independent asset. Um, So all of a sudden then when people are really, really scared, they lose sight of what you should be doing and how you actually find opportunity and things that don't matter trump the things that do so what they do is they exaggerate the downside and they vastly underestimate the upside and that spread is something that you know we want to work hard on because we want to take advantage of it doesn't mean that it's easy to right the work is tremendously hard because the other thing is when people aren't getting high prices guess what they don't do they don't sell. So what you do is all of a sudden the sellers are coming and like you're talking about, Brian, you just mentioned there's the spread between what they want and not. And then you have other ones that can't get the price so they don't sell. So your job gets a lot harder. But in the most fundamental, simple turn, emotion driven investing is what we are trying to avoid. Hence the reason when we're at the top, the bottom or sideways, independently analyzing the asset and the real opportunity that's there, understanding there's fluctuations in the market, that's what that's what we strive for. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I love that you guys are talking about too is a couple of times, Brian, you mentioned it, and I know you mentioned it, AJ, is we've been working on these things, whether it's relationships or the deals themselves, both for, for a long time in a lot of these instances to where, yeah, we might be pencils down today or the market might be or whatever's happening, but we were building those relationships a long time ago, nurturing those things. Well, the seller finance deal that you got, when did you first meet those owners? That was a solid two years from start to finish to get that one across the finish line of uh, consistent follow-up, building relationships, uh, building our credibility and establishing our reputation. It helps a ton. So really during those first 24 months was just 
um, they had a problem. How can we solve it? How can we uh, be there when they're, the time's right? Because a lot of things, especially when you're dealing in a, in a niche asset class or a smaller asset class, like for self-storage, like we've got 60, 70,000 facilities in the country. So we're not dealing with large, large numbers. There's only so many deals. And especially if you're talking, if you're, uh, you know, investing in certain geographic regions, if you have size requirements, if you're really trying to, to hit your buy box, there's, there's smaller numbers. So once we, and that's been a big thing for us, a big focus for us over the last three years is really kind of refining and honing our database because that's the goal. Like we want to buy those facilities and, and that's what we're racing towards. Whether it comes from off market, on market, a whole set, like the means to get there doesn't really matter to us. The goal is to buy these assets that we've identified that we can improve, we can ha run our investment strategy, and those will be good for us. So um, whether it's an off market relationship like that one that we, we nurtured, they take longer. Um, it was steak dinners, it was Christmas cards, it was calling hours on the phone with them, talking through, explaining things. Um, it's, it's just a lot of work, but those are great deals. And those are the deals that we've been able to get done this year in this market. Um, and then I look at a couple of the others. Some of them came from brokers, but those were deals that we've already already identified before they even went to a broker and signed up with a listing broker to bring it to market. Um, our, our eye was on the prize of buying these types of deals in these markets. Whatever means they come to us, hey, we'll we'll act accordingly and we'll we'll move move as is. But um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a lot of that, a lot of database refining this year, keeping the eye on the prize, staying focused, and then having to work um, much much harder to get these deals done. But it's it's worth it. Um, the alternative is to do nothing and. Yeah. And complain. Yeah, it's not, an yeah, it's not an option. So talk to us about that. Talk uh, or not. Talk to us about the the like like. Let's really dive into here the difference between and what you're seeing this year out on the market. So now we you know we understand what we do and why we do it, what we're doing, and how we view things. Which by the way, everybody has different buy boxes, target markets, right? The core principles though that Brian is talking about here are independent of what your buy box is meaning those are just things that you do, no matter what, where you're looking your size. So w talk to us though, the market in general this year versus the last, the prior two years and the shift that we've seen and that you have seen, first of all, when dealing with brokers, when dealing with sellers and deals on the market, like what is happening and walk us through that timeline. Because I know even from last fall to this fall, there, there's there been differences. Can you kind of give us just your outlook on what's taken place in the last three years? Yeah. Uh, I'll start with kind of the broker side on market deals and how we've seen a massive shift in that. Um, the last two to three years, um, any on market deal in self storage was getting bid up best and final, several rounds of best and final, and, and values just kept going up and up. So if you're sitting there on the broker side, it's all about getting those listings. Just take it to market. You've got hundreds of people downloading your deal. You've got several competing offers. Money's cheap. Uh, nobody could really price those. It was just kind of like, let's just see where it goes. And, and things were going up. So it was a great time to be on the broker side. Um, they were bringing out a lot of deals. Sellers were happy because they were getting top, top premium. Um, brokers were making a ton of money. So now, as that's completely shifted, similar to what we've been saying, those brokers went through a great summer season. They were reaping all those rewards. Now they're in that winter season. They're working much harder. But the key with working with those brokers are those brokers, especially if you're running a, you know, an aggressive acquisition strategy to buy real estate, those brokers are in those markets, in those trenches, just like you should be. They've got relationships that they've been building for long term. They've got insight knowledge. So the brokers serve such a, a, a key role in what we do, and it's it's a big piece of, of our business. Um, so now they're in a reverse role. They're they're struggling. Deals aren't closing. They're working three times as hard. 
to only have deals fall apart at the finish line because financing. So they're frustrated, but they still have those relationships. And I think those relationships are huge. So we've been spending a lot of time with the brokers that we work with in certain markets, um, just making sure that they know exactly what we're looking at, how we're underwriting deals, what types of deals we're still buying. And now those relationships that those brokers have bought or have, have built over the years are key for us to help reset some of these sellers' price expect expectations. So those sellers that are still kind of hanging on to a couple years ago pricing, um, the brokers can really be an ally for them. So if you're going an off-market strategy and you keep uh, talking with the seller and their their pricing expectations are so high, having, having the brokers kind of help reset market pricing and deliver that message hand in hand with what you're you're delivering is great and we need that kind of pricing reset. So having great relationships with those brokers right now, feeling for them, knowing that they're hurting as well, um, giving them feedback that can then arm them to go back to those sellers and start chipping away at this bid ask spread uh, is great. And then if you're in the trenches right there with them, feeding, giving them feedback, that's how you can really build strong relationships. And then when the deals are right, you're there to buy them and, and you're the first call to make. Um, so the on-market side that we've seen, certainly a big shift, but they play a, a big role in, in as these markets change, as pricing and valuation and cap rates change, they're, help, they're an ally. They're helping reset those expectations. Um, so that's how, how we kind of view those on-market deals. And again, bringing it back, like there's only so many deals in the markets that we really are in and want to invest in. We want to buy those deals. We want to keep building our portfolio. Um, we want to pick up efficiencies with management. So there's a lot of reasons that we would still want to buy on market deals, um, especially in. And in what's all that markets. volume looked like to you on market deals? How many on market deals are you seeing today versus in the last past three years? When you guys are looking at property management software for your storage facilities, there's a ton of options out there, but no other option compares to Tenant Inc. Tenant Inc. is going to be your one-stop shop solution that has an amazing amount of tools that you can deploy at your fingertips to maximize the value of your facility. They have an open API where you can back in almost anything you want. You own your data, and it's just an incredible solution. I can't say enough good things about these guys. Link is in the show notes. Be sure to check out Tenant Inc. Thanks everybody for listening. Now, if you're like me, which you're listening to this podcast, so you probably are, there just doesn't seem to be enough information. That's why we started our self-storage income community with over 300 members so far that are all doing self-storage. We include all of our webinars about underwriting, finding deals, market analysis, and operating. We include due diligence checklists and our underwriting modeler. So if you want more and you're ready to get started or expand your self-storage investing journey, join today our self-storage income community. So how many on-market deals are you seeing today versus in the last past three years? I would say the volume is down significantly. And what we're seeing is the quality is down too. And what I mean by that is a lot of the nicer product, institutional product, those types of owners are in a position, unless they're in a forced sell position, they're trying to weather this storm. They're, they know cap rates have gone up and values have gone down, so they, if they're not forced into a position to sell, they're less likely to go, go try the market. So there's been a lot less volume, um, and that means the, the deal quality has gone down too. So. When we look at smaller deals, sub-institutional deals, hairier deals, and by that I mean like they might have more problems, they might have a lot more CapEx, older properties, we're seeing a good, a good amount of those coming to market, um, which a lot of those sellers tend to be less concerned with the overall market. They might have, have owned them for a long time. There's a lot of reasons that they could sell, you know, the common death, divorce, all of that. Um, retirement. So that's where we're seeing more like deals transact this year. And that's great opportunity for, for people that are in that space, in that sub-institutional world that are buying these smaller deals. Those are going to transact for a number of different reasons. So I think that's been a big shift as far as like where we're seeing 
deals trade, um, those deals are more creative in this market, whereas you go towards more of the institutional quality deals, very debt dependent and where interest rates are, and that's why we've seen a lot less volume there. Um, so that's kind of been uh, where where we've been seeing things shake out. And then that brings up some opportunities to, to kind of maybe shift your, your buying criteria a little bit and, and hone in on some of those or follow up with some of those sellers that you might have been building relationships with over the past few years to, to really understand where they're at and what position they're in and, and try and put some deals together. And what's the bid ask spread that you're seeing? You mentioned that, you know, prior the broker would take it to market and it, the price would literally get driven up. So the bid ask was the ask was 2 million and then the bids 2.5 million, <laughs> you know, like, uh, so w what is that today compared to what we saw? We, you know, you talked quality, right? Things like that, but w what are they asking for versus receiving or not receiving? Yeah. Um, I mean, we had record low cap rates in self storage. So for A class products, I mean, deals were being done in the fours and low fives, and um, that was kind of the norm. So that's the high mark. That's the high water mark that these a lot of these sellers have ingrained, and a lot of them too, as they were underwriting those deals, they they underwrote with exit assumptions, saying, "Yeah, it's a four cap market now. It's going to no. keep going." Yep. So. So they already had their model set where there was like, well, we kind of need to sell at a four cap. So their pricing expectations were set based on a high watermark when we were at record low cap rates. Now, as, as interest rates have gone up, I mean, really, for, unless you're buying like all cash or buying non-cash flowing deals, um, your cost of debt is real like where cap rates should be trending we see a lag there but that's that's what we've seen so we've seen four and a half to five cap five percent cap rates um when we were at the peaks and now realistically those should be six and a half to sevens so that's kind of the bid ask spread that we're seeing um like a 200 basis point almost spread yeah from go yeah and in third fourth tier markets um, I think that's probably a little higher. Are you seeing the same meaning that, you know, they were trending actually fairly close to what the rest of the market was more like five, six, but they're, you know, is there a difference between a, an a, a spread on an A-class facility in Southern California versus like they went up 200 basis points, but then in Pasigula, Mississippi, what would that look like for a small asset like that? Absolutely. And and those are all tied into each other. So like if you're an investor and you're looking at all the opportunities in front of you and you could go out to a top tier market, find a newly built, fully stabilized asset and the market cap rates a six and a half. You're pricing your there's there's very little risk on that. That market's known stabilized low capex for the foreseeable future. Like there is little risk on that. Compare that deal side by side with your Mississippi example in a third tier market that's a 30 year old property that needs a ton of CapEx. The business plan to run that is a lot more complex and there's a lot of moving parts. You need to you know, remodel the facility. There's a lot that can go wrong. Your budget can get go out of the water. Your rates could be um, washed out. So there's less risk on that A-class deal, more risk on those smaller market value add deals. So as an investor, if you had the option to pick one or two, and you would say, I would, I would like the nice one for this six cap, I would take this one if I had a chance to make a higher return. And so that's why those cap rates on those smaller deals in smaller markets, as the industry changes and cap rates in general across the board change, there still needs to be a spread based on the risk of buying a fully stabilized class A new facility compared to a heavy, heavy value add complex business plan, a lot of moving parts. So there has to be some sort of, of spread there. And so as cap rates go up, that kind of spread between A-class assets and C-class assets, that's why you see that gap there. And there's also the debt problem, right? Meaning that how the bank, who, who the bank's going to give money to at what cost, right? If I'm, if the bank is looking at something in, you know, um, Orange County, California, at what they want to loan to, 
they're going to look at a whole bunch of factors like you just mentioned, replacement cost, land values, things like that, see it's more stable. So they're probably going to loan more on a debt to income and also give probably more favorable terms as well as better interest rates because they look at it and say, if it's a safer investment and if we had to take it back, we know we could, there, there's not as much unknowns where a bank looking at something in a fourth or fifth tier market, right? Like we are mentioning 30 years old, everything. They go, if I got to take that back, look at all this work that has to be done. We, like we wouldn't even know what to do. Like we're going to just lose the asset because we can't do this. We don't know anything about it. So all of a sudden you have to pay a lot for our money in that situation because I have to offset the risk of you giving it back to me and us not being able to do it. I can't get extra space to manage that. Whereas in Orange County, I can immediately just go hire extra space and they'll just take it over for me. So like, I find that banks look at that and they're like, all right, well, let's say uh, I'll give you uh, six and a half interest rate uh, on the Orange County one, but when you're in this fourth tier market in Mississippi or wherever, um, that, no, you're not getting six and a half, you're getting eight or eight and a half because you have to pay for the risk. And I love the idea of leveraging those brokers and helping to drive that narrative and educate those individuals. And you'd mentioned providing them the, the tools to go back and chip away and help provide that education. What specific tools would you recommend people arm their brokers with to go and talk to those owners and operators? I'm sure it's probably deal specific, but. Yeah, I, I mean, just being having good rapport, good relationship, consistent communication with some of those brokers and just letting them, just talking with them, letting them know what you're seeing, how your underwriting has changed. And that's been a big thing when you compare a couple years ago to where we are now. Like uh, brokers are, brokers are trying their best to, to underwrite a deal. Good ones are like they're, um, they're, they've got a pulse on the market. They know they can't go set realistic expectations because then the deal's never going to transact. So they want the deal to transact. So they want your insight, your info to bring a competitive deal to market that they know has a good opportunity of, of closing and setting those pricing expectations because they don't want to go through a four-month process with a seller and then get to the end and be like, here's your offer. And the seller was like at five and you, every all the offers were coming in at three. Like they know they just worked for five months and they're not don't have a chance to make anything. So when doing that, a lot of those converse, conversations are just, hey, this is what I'm seeing in the market. And what are you seeing? So for instance, on re rates, like that's been a big thing for 2023. Street rates have plummeted. And in a lot of markets, they still haven't bottomed out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're in the slow season. Hopefully we see that moving forward in 24, we can see a trend kind of go back. But when we were in a, a market cycle where month over month, average street rates in markets just creeping up, just creeping up. And you could see that trend, everyone could. Occupancies were all high. Um, so that's, those are some of the good, good things to be talking and communicating with on brokers is like, what are you seeing for occupancy in the market? What are you hearing from other operators? Where are we at? Relaying that back to them. And then what are we planning on for um, street rates? And then year over year rent increases. Cause those are some big underwriting assumptions that help arm that uh, broker to then underwrite accordingly based on how you're, you're underwriting because they want to marry those two up. That's how they get paid. They, so. They're a market maker. Yeah. And this is a really good point because I saw this the other day, an email, maybe you sent it to me, I can't even remember, but I was looking at an on-market deal and the pro forma on the on-market deal was, okay, in the next year and a half, you are gonna raise occupancy to this level and you're going to get rates up to this level. And I went and looked at the market and like you said, the market hadn't even bottomed out yet, meaning the rates were still going lower. And I look at that and I think to myself, okay, how do you come up with that? Meaning that the broker is now selling this asset with the uh, intention and to, it's like almost built into the price that it's going to be here yet everything is going the opposite direction. And that's a really important conversation to have. Say, first of all, we don't see this the same. How do you get to this, right? So how are you saying that this 10 by 10, you can charge in a year and a half for more than every single quarter that has gone down? Why, why all of a sudden is that get inverse? And occupancy has gone down every single quarter. You're saying in a year and a half, it's gonna be up. 
how do you get to those numbers, right? And understand those because at the end of the day, all brokers are our market makers. They're putting sellers and buyers together. And the, you can be the most successful with your broker partners, which they are. And perfect example is this when after 2008, I went and met with a broker um, and I sat down with him and we, we talked for hours and we didn't, I didn't say, Hey, what's a good deal. I didn't even say, you know, what deals do you have? No, we talked about right now in the market, our philosophical approach to this asset class. What does the next five years look at? Who's winners? Who's losers? What's going to happen? How do you run these things? And where's the potential in everything else? Um, we walked away from that meeting and he understood how we viewed it. He understood what I saw when I was looking at the asset classes. Uh, he sold us 10 deals off market and it was almost every single deal he bought or brought us, we bought. The reason being is he knew exactly what we wanted and he underwrote to us. And if you're dealing with a broker that's you are saying you're a buyer, you better let that partner know what you're a buyer of. Not, not even the deal. Like you said, if you're underwriting, what does your underwriting look like to be a buyer? Because if you waste brokers time, they're not going to work with you because you're destroying, they're trying to make a market and that market didn't even exist. So they're getting burned. And the, it costs money for these people, okay? If you're a broker out there, you're working your freaking butt off this year. It is hard. And you get paid after the work, only if the market takes place, only if a market transaction takes place. And good brokers, you guys, are worth their weight in gold. Like, it's hard to even describe how valuable they are because of the work that they put in. So don't, don't waste their time. Don't mess with them. Don't be wishy-washy because they're never going to bring you deals and they're never going to work with you. And so what Brian's saying here is saying, this is how I'm underwriting. And two, have them challenge you and you challenge them. It, it, me and this broker that I've worked with for a long, long period of time, I would challenge him and he would challenge me. We would sit down in rooms and just go over underwriting. And I'd say, ah, uh, nope, I don't see how you're seeing this. You're going to have to right. And then he'd say, well, no, you're not seeing this. And me and him together would fine tune that underwriting and it just got better and better and better. So it all of a sudden speed and the deals we were getting were great because of that open communication, that sharing with him. Um, don't expect a broker to give you a deal by saying, Hey, send me deals. That's not how it works. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, it's, and that's a hard, like, I guess, even from your standpoint, when you're trying to express that to brokers, I mean, you've got your underwriting, you're showing them you have it and something, Brian, you talk about all the time. You really shifted our organization to this because we were way more open and we were deal specific and saying, we just want a good deal. We knew what made that good deal where you said we got to really drill down our buy box. And that was everything from markets to a lot more finite that allowed us to buy more deals. So when people are saying, okay, what would your suggestion be to them? How do you get your buy box down? And what do brokers want to know of your buy box? So that, that these people listening to the podcast, they can make a market, they can provide it. How do you drill? How do you make a buy box, a good one? And how do you express that to a broker? Yeah, I think, I think that's critical first step. And it can, it doesn't have to be so niche. You don't have to get so specific. Like I only buy 40 to 50,000 square feet and it's in these markets. You're going to be left with like 20 properties that you could buy. So you want to have it broad enough where you've got a big enough, I like calling it like the sandbox that you play in. You got a big enough sandbox to play in to be pursuing on market, off market deals because it's an all out. Like it's kind of the, the playground, like go out and do whatever it takes to find some of those deals in that, in that sandbox. So um, starting with that, not going too small, but like having a good size and a good way to do that, especially getting started, is not overwhelming yourself to get to get going. Like when if you're just getting started and, and trying to define your buy box, you can crawl before you start running at a full pace. And what I mean by that is like, Start with markets around you that you know and feel confident in and are specific. Start building your database around that. 
And that's really when I talk buy box, like it revolves around the effort and work going into building your database. And I think for any successful long-term real estate company, like it's all about the database that you build, the relationships, the knowledge. So we've underwrote, we save all of our underwriting, we save all of the information that we get, compile it all into our database. And then when we're looking at a deal that pops up in six months or six years, we've already done some homework, we know what's going on. And I think the process of slowly starting to build out your database, your buy box, what deals you're trying to buy, um, is so important because a lot of this, whether you're dealing with a broker or going off market, a lot of the early stages, you're trying to just establish credibility and I can transact this deal and solve your problems and we can do this deal. And if you don't have a buy box, it's tough to go have those conversations, broker or seller, and give give off the confidence that like I'm here out for a purpose. Like I know exactly what I I know what I'm looking for. I know what I'm doing. Um, I'm not. I didn't just happen to to call you. Like I'm here. This is what I'm looking for. These are the types of deals. So I think that starting out buying your buy, building your buy box. Start small. Keep building upon that. You can always go bigger as you go. But like it all revolves around building that database because you want to give off the credibility and you want to have the knowledge to then, let's say you do get, make a cold call to an owner and they're like, you know what? I really do want to sell. Great. Like that's why we do that. But okay, you caught one. Now what do you do? Like you got to have the knowledge and the insight and it's got to kind of be a process from start to finish. So I think starting with the, the buy box, it can always change and ours has changed over the years. We, we change our buy box kind of, we review it quarterly. We say, hey, the market shifted. Should we go to some new markets? Should we go to some smaller, bigger deals, new opportunities? So I think that's, um, that's our thought process around starting out building a buy box, building an acquisitions pipeline and a database. And you, you're, you're right, you're gonna reframe that massively. It, it, like, really good advice. Yeah, our buy box has changed wildly, obviously. We started out in like they're not even third, fourth tier markets. These were maybe not even markets. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, it, it's just, um, and now from there that we're developing it and we're buying in first tier markets. And that's okay. That's okay to change. It's in fact, not only okay, it's necessary um, and flexible. And so the question for me would be, what do you do if the market isn't correlated with your buy box? Meaning this, what if your buy box that you build off of, because let's say you're starting out, you don't have the data. This is why data is important because you can change your buy box, you can see what's going on in the market and you can look back and see performance as you move along. But what if you say, all right, my buy box for non-data, I don't, I've never bought a facility. My buy box is in these cities, maybe in this state that I live and it's 10 to 20,000 square feet and um, I want a mom and pop owner, but then all of a sudden, just hypothetical, right? There is zero for sale, they won't sell. And for some reason, those mar those are the highest ones, meaning there's not even new. So then all of a sudden somebody's sitting here going, my buy box, the market is making it so that doesn't even, I can't even do anything, can't even work. What would you suggest to, like how much, I guess the question is, how much external stuff do you need to look at and be willing to change within your buy box versus internal stuff? Because external stuff does affect it, right? And so when it comes time to shift with the marketplace, what do you shift and what do you not? And I think a lot of people right now are having a hard time with this because the market shifted so much. Like, what should I change and, and what should I not on my buy box? Should I move down market? Should I move up market? And it, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think first and foremost, uh, in self-storage, geographically speaking, markets are uh, easier to broaden. Like it's easier to s stay in a deal size range. Say you're like sub $3 million, uh, 20 to 50,000 square foot facilities. Like that's an easier uh, thing to diversify and start going after, after more markets, more states because you only have so many numbers. Yeah. So add on more, get your database wider and wider and cast a wider net geographically speaking. I think that's an easy, the, the easiest first step. Um, the next thing I would say is if 
the market's changing a lot. So much of what you do with uh, acquisitions is tied in directly to how you're sourcing capital and how you're structuring these deals. And so that's the next place I look at is what other opportunities are there to open up maybe potential partnerships, maybe find different sources of capital, maybe uh, structure deals in a different way, meaning seller financing or, or creative type deal structures. So that's the second umbrella that I would open up and uh, and put your shift your focus. And, and I would finish by saying you're still you still kind of have to have a good understanding of the market in general. Um, and if you're out there hitting hitting the deals, hitting the brokers, hitting the, the stuff and you're just getting started and you feel like you're spinning your tires, it, if you're out trying to compete in class A markets f- with the REITs on buying deals that they buy and fits their buy box, you're going to have a, a very hard time if you're just yes. getting started out. So being realistic, making sure that you're not spending time in the wrong areas. And by that, I mean, like if you're trying to, to chase down your first deal and you're in the uh, LA and, and you're competing with extra space and public on the hundred thousand square foot, $40 million deal. Like you're going to have a heck of a time convincing that seller that you're credible, convincing that broker that your, your offer is even reasonable. So you got to have like a good overall understanding of like the What's sandbox realistic. that you, you, yes, can, you play can play in. in. And, I, and I love that there's, there's this thing where it's like, Oh, well, this is what I want. This is what I like. Cause I have this thesis and you're like, that's great, but then there is also the reality of the situation in which you can actively execute. Now, you may argue and say, "No, you can, you know, you can do anything you put your mind to." Okay, yeah, but that may mean you have to get to it in a different way. You may have to start somewhere else and 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 then build up to it, right? Or you may have to change complete structures. All right, maybe you can't do that, but maybe you can partner up with somebody exactly. that can, right? So it's the dealing with your sandbox and manipulating your sandbox to the reality of the situation. I like that. In meaning you're taking into account, you know what you want and you want to do, but you do need to move that around predicated on the opportunities that lie in front of you, or you're just going to be sitting here beating yourself up and then it's going to become about you. Meaning that it's, I can't do this. I can't win at this. And well, you know, I I always think that's funny when people are like, I just don't think I can do it. And I'm like, no, you can't. That's 100% true. Yeah, you can't do it. And if it's predicated on you being able to do it, you should stop and give up because it's not an I thing. It's a we thing. You have to have partners. You have to have help. You're right. You cannot do it. But when you open up to change structures, get help, do things, then you can. And I think a lot of people right now expect it to be done in a certain way. I expect a broker to give it to me and I expect a bank to give me that money. And then when a broker won't give me a deal and when a bank says, yeah, you don't have any money nor experience, I'm not going to give you the money. You go, well, it's all about me. I can't do this. And then they stop. And for me, that's your first problem, right? So changing your circumstances and changing the like that that perimeter or what makes that buy box so you can play in it. Uh, that's absolute gold. So what else do you got that you're seeing in the market? What are some other things that you know you want to cover that's on your mind today, aside from us just sitting here quizzing you? Oh yeah, I think uh, I think one of the big things that we've been seeing here in 2023 too, which is probably a good thing, is a slowdown in some of the developments. Um, development cycles, mirror market cycles, when money's cheap and opportunities are there, deals pencil. And so developers love that and they'll go crazy. Now we talk about this all the time is like the biggest threat to self storage is too much self storage. And so that development slowdown, as frustrating as it is, I think in most markets is very helpful. that doesn't mean that there aren't development opportunities out there still today, but you gotta work three times as harder and filter through and really understand what you're getting yourself into, understand where uh, the market is, supply and demand, um, try and find, pinpoint some good opportunities to develop. So I think overall, like there's not, 2023 has been extremely frustrating, I think for most people in the industry, um, especially coming off the highs of the last. But I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I don't think it's all bad news. I think these are some healthy things that we're seeing in the industry that give me hope and make me excited and opportunistic looking ahead. It's like self-storage is is going to remain strong. 
the fundamentals are there. The, uh, the utilization of self-storage continues to increase. Um, so there's a lot of like things to even pull from this year and trends to spot that still make me excited for, for the future here and, and feel confident that we're in a good, a good, good place. But I think, especially in the past, probably call it six months, a lot of these development deals that take a ton of time and uh, take years to get to a point where they can even stick a shovel in the ground. And so seeing a lot of these opportunities that have been in the works for a long time, now they're ready to go. They've got permits and everything and they go revisit their numbers and a bank's like, well, a lot's changed. Lots changed I am not gonna finance you. So now they're left either trying to sell that or just holding it if they can until things start to change. But um, the development side of the business certainly has been uh, extremely challenging here to try and try and get deals to pencil when you're in, up against rising debt costs, construction costs. You know, we're starting to hear some murmurs of some uh, costs come down, but we still haven't really seen that pass through to, to our projects. And then you're dealing with that that market condition, like we talked about, where rates are softening a lot and in some markets more than others, but they're still trending down. Occupancies have, have fallen. And so you're building a new facility and you got to lease that thing up. And so that's where a lot of the questions come up, a lot of the concerns from lenders, from investors, from developers. So they're looking at these projects. So it's healthy for existing storage owners. It's good. We need that. We don't need to just keep flooding markets with supply and supply and supply. I mean, knowing, speaking from just here where our office is in Boise, there's 20 development sites around town here that are all at various stages, but a lot of them have, have come off, um, have, have kind of stalled out, which I think is, is really good, healthy. Few of those will continue. A few of those will be good development sites, but it's a good reset and expectation for just, I think, the fundamentals of self-storage. Yeah. It, well, this is a really important point because the reason why self-storage has done so good in the last 10 years was because of 2008. And a lot of people look at market conditions and they say, well, I can't do it in these conditions. You know, it's, I wish I could go back 10 years ago. And I'm like, oh, so you wish you could go back when interest rates were high, rates were falling and occupancies were going down? Well, why, can, why, why do you think that you would have invested then when you won't invest today? When we first got started, first of all, it was hard to get banks to even give us money. Um, rates were astronomically low in storage. Rates were had never really gone up. Occupancies were never in the 90s. That didn't even exist. And then when we started to, wanted to scale, we were buying in markets where occupancy was dropping and rates were dropping. They didn't bottom out. They hadn't turned around. They were going down. And we bought because when things are going down, people sell at discounts. They have to do things they wouldn't do before. When it bottoms out and starts to turn around, that spread is gone. Now they say, oh no, it's getting better. So now I am going to sell it at Performer and everything. And the truth of the matter is that most people don't believe they are m emotionally reactive. They don't, they believe, oh yeah, if I could go back, I would. The only reason you're saying that is because the emotional fear is gone because you see the outcome. So you don't have an emotional fear reaction because you already know the outcome and it was good. But now you go into like today and people are like, oh, well, I'm going to wait for conditions to change, meaning I'm going to wait for the outcome to occur. So I have the fear, yet I'm also want the discounted price with the unknown, right? That doesn't work. That doesn't exist. And I see often now I'm like, you know, it's, it's the same thing. No, you wouldn't have bought 2010 to 12 or eight to 12. You wouldn't have bought. Why? Because we know, because you're not buying now, right? And this is a hard thing. And it's a hard thing for a lot of people to, uh, I think, kind of wrap their head around and really to be able to see opportunities in these markets and to digest it. Um, but more importantly, to get over uh, a lot of the fear. And I, I mean that personally. When we bought our first large facility, which was, I think, three, $3.3 million, it, it, frankly, it terrified me. Um, but I had to say, everything that we see here says that this is correct. And then I went out and I got third-party people, non-affiliated, to tell me. 
say feasibility studies that nope this is good even though everything else in my body in my mind my emotions was saying what are you doing you're in the middle of a huge real estate crisis and you're buying a multi-million dollar property while everybody else is going bankrupt like how stupid are you right and it was i just had to make a line item where yes i had third-party confirmations that i'm not making up stuff or seeing it and then i said my feelings don't matter bye and i had to actually physically make a break and that's what we did and we bought and then it was all right now let's get to work and let's make it you know happen and that outcome happened but the first thing to do is realize i think the emotions that they're okay it's not that you aren't scared in fact that's actually good why that makes you a reasonable person if people that are just buy happy oh i'm gonna buy everything and they don't see and they're not worried about it that's actually terrifying to me too because i'm like you are uh, you, you are unreasonable and you are ignoring downsides to justify buying you don't want to do that either right you just want to recognize the emotion and then you want to be pragmatic about it and then you want to like brian said do the work here's the work do it we do it we do it we do it we do it then the outcomes come right um and i think that you know although that is hard i actually think that's a lot of times easier for people starting out the reason being is they now may have an opportunity where other people have things to lose so a lot of people are like ah pencils down we're gonna wait why because i have the money i have this all so i can wait till things are better right till it's easier i'm not gonna go through all that work but. yeah yeah do the work i mean if i was to summarize what what we're doing it's we're still pursuing off-market deals we're still cold calling like crazy we're still sending mailers those things work, so we're not going to stop doing them. We're still building relationships and following up with all the sellers of properties that we we like, um, and nurturing those whether they want to sell to us in 30 days or in five years. We're still building new relationships with brokers and nurturing the relationships that we have, giving them feedback, two-way street. We're still making offers on deals. Um, we're still in the market. We're still aware. That's why we've been able to do some deals here. Uh, this year in 2023. And if we're talking about what's ahead in 2024, a lot of that's not going to change. We're still going to be doing all that stuff day in, day out. We're going to pick our heads up, see how the market's going, see how we need to adjust underwriting, valuing, how we're making offers, opportunities we're seeing. But like, that's the work that we're talking about. Do that day in, day out, build a team around that, uh, build a culture around that. And then you'll you'll have success, you'll, you'll, you'll have fear on doing deals, certainly. Like nobody, I don't think anybody could be doing deals in this market right now and be like, oh, this is a home run. Yeah. I have no fear, like this is a grand slam. Yeah. We saw some of that yeah. in the past few years where it was like this, we knocked the cover off the ball on this one and we haven't even closed on it. It's yeah. like, okay, but that's right now, like just being realistic and doing the work. And that's, that's what we talk about when we say doing the work. I love it. Well, thanks, dude, for coming on here. We've been over an hour. We really appreciate your insight, everybody. Um, brokers, y'all want to get a hold of us? Contact Brian. Please bring us those good deals. Uh, he's he's ready to knock, knock them down. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. Thanks. thanks.